Happy New Year. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. <clears throat> My name is An Chung Young, professor of economics at Zhuang University, as well as uh, the foreign investment ombudsman at Kotra. Uh, this morning, I am very much delighted and honored to moderate this special breakfast session on competition in an era of turbulence and transition, lectured by Dr. Deborah Wynne-Smith, the president of the prestigious Council on Competitiveness. The topic this morning is just perfectly fitting to Korea at this point in time, because Korea is addressing now how to get out of from the current global crisis quickly, and uh, how to prepare herself to a newly emerging economic system in the post-crisis period. Korea is poised to search for how Korea can enhance national competitiveness <clears throat> so that Korea can escape from the sandwich position being engulfed between China and Japan. As you know well, the Yimengbak government has established the Presidential Council on International Competitiveness immediately after inauguration almost a year ago. The council meet on a fixed date every month to undertake a zero-based deregulation to create a truly business-friendly environment and uh, to search for a new source of sustainable growth. In recent years, Korea's potential growth rate has been declining very rapidly. It used to be 8% growth a decade ago, but now 4% level even before the global financial crisis. Given the very low growth rate of labor force and the low growth rate of capital stock, the key question for Korea to tackle is related to how to enhance a total factor productivity. How Korea is going to design a national R&D and uh, science technology regime? What are new component in national innovation system in this unprecedented uh, global economic crisis since the Great Depression in 1930s? The Imenba government is going to carry on a large-scale project of eco-friendly for major river systems and further focus on green growth strategy, very similar to incoming Mr. Obama's Green New Deal. Korea depends on 100% on imported oil, basically from the Middle East. It's spending more than $60 billion in 2007. Korea's compressed growth model was made on energy intensive industries. A big question is how Korea can push the green growth strategy, including alternative renewable energy. Who are major actors? What role the government should play in the green growth strategy? Many people are still wondering in Korea whether economic growth and uh, environmental preservation and protection are compatible with each other. Dr. Deborah Wins-Smith is recognized in the global business community as a go-to person in technology policy as exemplified her appointment to the board of NASDAQ Stock Exchange. In fact, she served many important posts in the government as well as private communities. She served on many chairs, including nuclear energy for the Secretary of Energy. This is really the eye-catch part as far as I'm concerned. 
and as assistant director in the White House Office of Science and Technology. Dr. Winston Smith graduated magna cum laude from Vassar College, master degree from King's College, Cambridge University. In 2006, she received her honorary doctoral degree from Michigan State University. Without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Wynne Simmons to the podium. Thank you, Professor Ahn, for that lovely introduction. And I'm very delighted to be here in Seoul. Um, it's a little bit chilly here, not quite as cold as Washington. But um, I did bring my warm gear in case I have a chance to, to go out and enjoy your lovely city. Um, first of all, I, I would like to thank the um, Korean Institute for Global Economics, President uh, Lee, for inviting me for his leadership, and of course, Dr. Sakon, the chairman of the new National Competitiveness Council um, that your new President Lee established last year. We were really delighted. Uh, in Washington when we heard about the creation of the National Competitiveness Council of Korea. And I just read in the paper, actually, that um, Chairman Sakong is probably going to step down and be in an advisory role. So I know he got it started, and I'm looking forward to seeing him um, later today to discuss how we can collaborate together. Um, clearly, you know, this is a time of tremendous turbulence. It's a time of transition, but very excitingly, it's a time of transformation. And as many of you know, uh, Washington is all uh, preparing for the inauguration next week of um, President-elect Obama. My office happens to be very close to where he and his family are staying at the Hay Adams Hotel. So it's taking us two hours each way to get into the city. But it really is a very, very exciting time um, with a lot of energy and a lot of renewal. And of course, that is very much part of competitiveness and innovation and all the things I'm going to talk about. Um, just for those of you who may not know about the Council on Competitiveness, we are a unique organization in the United States. We were founded about um, 22 years ago uh, by John Young, who was the then president of Hewlett Packard. And our organization is the only group in the United States that brings together chief executive officers from every sector of our economy, they join together with our leading university presidents and labor leaders to understand what are the drivers and factors influencing U.S. productivity growth, how we maintain a rising standard of living for all our citizens, and how we compete in global markets. I was in the uh, Reagan White House, actually, when the U.S. Council on Competitiveness was formed. And this was a time of great technology and trade competition and conflict between the United States and Japan. And that was really the genesis for the creation of our council. And um, we're bipartisan. We work with both uh, parties on all of our issues. And in addition to our flagship product, the Competitiveness Index, that we've done for many years in collaboration with Michael Porter at Harvard, we also have a robust action agenda that we present to political leaders, to governors, as well as to influence the things that industry and academia and labor and society at large need to do to ensure that the next generation of Americans will be prosperous, and very importantly, that we will continue to be a global leader in advancing global growth and prosperity and security. Um, what I want to do today is really focus on this changing competitiveness landscape that we're all dealing with in the world, and also to focus on what are some of the longer term challenges and strategies we need to deploy. And then I'll talk a little bit about some of the immediate uh, issues and challenges we're dealing with in this uh, tremendous global financial crisis that many uh, CEOs in the United States are really saying is the worst that they've seen, not only in their lifetime, but perhaps since the Depression. So let me start um, by talking a little bit about uh, what I see as eight transformational shifts that are driving this global world that is in a tremendous time of transition. 
any one of these shifts alone would be significant, but when you take them together, the effects are absolutely monumental. Now the first, of course, is the digital revolution, and this has been an epical force of change. The share of information and communications, technology capital, and the world capital stock has risen rapidly over the 20 years across all global regions. Just in the United States over the last 20 years, we've seen our gross private domestic investment in computers and software grow from $7.8 billion to $393 billion. From 92 to 2006, U.S. industry purchases of IT and software exceeded industry spending on all other types of capital equipment, accounting for 57% of all industry investment in 2006. And by 2016, we predict that U.S. private investment in IT computers and software is expected to reach $863 billion. Now, of course, the impact of this has been one of the great drivers of the productivity acceleration boom we had in the first part of the 21st century and the fact that IT promulgated across every sector of our economy to enable companies such as Walmart and Starbucks to be key, become leading technology companies in, de, in addition to de, deploying their prime businesses. And of course Korea has been also a tremendous leader as well in the IT revolution, starting up the chain from lower value consumer electronics to now having many corporations such as Samsung that are leading the frontiers of visualization and the rollout of broadband and all these other capabilities. Now these rapid advances in computing power and software and communications have really led a set of powerful complementary innovations because they have transformed trade, they've transformed labor markets, and very importantly the way in which production and services are organized and conducted through production slicing. Time and distance are compressing, knowledge is diffusing rapidly, and so we have this global interconnectedness that has increased at a mind-boggling level and pace. And we've seen, of course, the impact of IT and communications in the financial crisis, how both in a positive sense this led to integration of global financial markets but I will also say, being on the technology side, that some of the complexity of obscure financial instruments and modeling and simulation in the hedge funds perhaps played a negative role in this context. Today we also see that this revolution has brought the ability for entrepreneurs and small firms to have a global footprint and to reach customers globally that heretofore would have been impossible through email, marketing, we have now social face networking sites, and also of course there's the dark side as well of how this interrelated and interglobal connectivity has impact, impact on national security as well. The second shift of great importance, and you have been a very big driver of this in the world, is the rapid advance and power of emerging economies who but 20 years ago competed on natural resources, low-skill commodity goods, working their way slowly up the economic development curve. And that curve has been shattered. The digital revolution has enabled these countries to have access to the modern business tools and connections of advanced economies. They're now integrated into global value chain. And they are increasingly the favored location for direct foreign investment. These countries are seeking to follow the path of the world's innovators. They are adopting innovation-based growth strategies, boosting government and private sectors R&D spending, building research parks, regional centers of innovation, ramping up the production of scientists and engineers. And of course, Korea has been a phenomenal success in the post-World War II arena. I first visited Korea back in 1986 on a trip actually at the time with the then Secretary of Commerce, Malcolm Baldrige. And I remember meeting with the leaders of the Korean science and technology enterprise. And today, looking forward, again, what Korea has accomplished is absolutely phenomenal. Now, of course, if you look at China, the acceleration is even greater in terms of how their R&D investment grew from 12 billion to 86 billion in just a decade putting China in third place in R&D spending behind only the United States 
and Japan. Now, demographics and population, of course, are playing a huge role in emerging economies because they represent the markets of the future. By 2020, we estimate that 80% of middle class consumers will live outside the developed world. And these are the prime markets for innovative products and services. These countries are our partners, our competitors, as well as powerful consumers who have choice to determine what, when, and what they are going to buy. The United States, very interestingly, on this chart, you'll look after the EU, 49% growth projection. We are the only advanced developed country in the world that has a positive demographics going forward. Even though we have an aging population, we still have a dynamic youth population, and this is going to be very, very important for the future. Goldman Sachs estimates that by 2039, the combined economies of Brazil, Russia, India, and China could be larger than the combined economies of the US, Japan, the UK, Germany, France, and Italy. Now, as a result of this rapid advancement, in just one generation, emerging economy share of global imports, exports, and foreign direct investment have nearly doubled. Now also, emerging economies are now leading the world's technology exporters, and they are having a profound impact on global production and trade. Many have become leading producers and exporters of high-tech products. For example, China's domestic high-tech production is twice that of Germany and nearly the same as of Japan. And you can see on this chart that Korea ranks fifth behind Germany with 167 uh, billion dollars and 97 dollars in terms of exports of high tech. Now the third transformation is the emergence of the integrated global enterprise and as you can see I'm trying to kind of uh, distinguish between the first 20th century model and the second 20th century model where headquarters had overseas operations and then in the latter part of the 20th century they created in effect many companies all over the world. However, now we have a truly integrated global enterprise, a 21st century model in which we have seamless, digitally enabled enterprise of company, foreign affiliates, suppliers, contractors, and workers. And these supply chains are global. And they are building, these companies, global talent networks for innovation. They assemble the right combination of knowledge and skills needed for the products and developing the innovations and determining, very importantly, where their first product deployment will occur. So this is creating multiple locations for creating and dispersing innovation. In effect, I would say it's creating new global competition for talent, investment, and the enabling infrastructure. And this development is changing the nature of trade itself. Twenty years ago, Trade was about moving goods physically across national borders. But today, global enterprises increasingly develop products and services and serve their customers through foreign affiliates and foreign business ventures. A very important piece of data that came out of our 2006 Competitiveness Index that the sales from foreign affiliates of U.S. companies are more than three times greater than all U.S. exports of goods and services, which means that their wealth is being created outside the United States. We do not have the data yet of how much of that wealth actually returns back for investment, reinvestment in the United States. For us, as the U.S. Competitiveness Council, one of our big goals is to ensure that we continue to be the place that attracts this high-value investment for high-value, innovative activity. Now, the fourth transformation is a global trade in tasks, and this is unprecedented in human history because now billions of people in emerging economies have entered global commerce. And as a result, the effective global labor supply has quadrupled between 1980 and 2005. And we see that there is a growing global talent pool of a professional workforce that is competing for these jobs, 
with many educated and skilled people competing and performing with excellence. So, for the first time in human history, with this global trade in tasks, there is what we call at the U.S. Council on Competitive 24-7 Global Labor Arbitrage, which means, in effect, that within a 24-hour period or less, companies can determine and redetermine who's going to do the work where and in what part of the world. And every day, it is easier to ship work around the globe in bits and bytes. So, let's make no mistake, if work is routine, if work is rule-based, if work can be digitized, there's going to be a low-cost source of labor somewhere in the world to compete for that work and those jobs. And quite frankly, for countries like the United States and Korea, trying to compete on routine standardized work and low labor is a downward cycle that takes you nowhere. So, when companies decide to go and invest and perform their most advanced activities as well as all of the activities, what are some of the issues that they look at? Well, obviously, you know, there's exchange rates, there's the knowledge base, where are smart people? There are labor rates and availability and labor flexibility. Labor flexibility is a challenge for Korea. It's a huge asset in the United States. We have what we call labor churn. While we lose a lot of jobs, we are continually creating jobs. And this is part of creative destruction. The regulatory environment is absolutely critical. The quality of local management, tax treatment. One of the issues I happen to serve, I don't know whether this is a uh, reward or a punishment, but I have an eight-year term as a Senate-confirmed appointee on the board of oversighters that runs the U.S. Internal Revenue Service. And for the first time now, our new commissioner is moving out globally into the arena to look at tax, to look at how companies are either shirking, not shirking, being a positive player in this global tax treatment, and how taxes actually play a role in investment. Markets, proximity, and incentives countries offer to lure global investment and business. On the last one, of course, we know the story of Ireland, where Ireland really, through tax incentives, a good skilled workforce, a positive regulatory environment, really transformed itself so that one out of three Irish workers are working for advanced U.S. companies. But now, that strategy is no longer operative, and Ireland has to come up with a new model, and in fact, that model has to be innovation. The recent news we've heard about India and the um, illegality and the fudging of books that occurred with one of their major uh, IT outsourcers, Satacom, is going to have a huge impact now on not only India's brand, but on the outsourcing and who's going to go and trust their most financial fi uh, data in the hands of companies that do not have high standards of corporate government governance or transparency. So the fifth transformation, and the one that I personally believe that countries such as the United States and Korea and advanced R&D nations have to be incredibly excited about, is that we are on the cusp. In fact, we are involved now in one of the great technological revolutions of humankind, where the digital revolution, the biotechnology revolution, and the nanotechnology revolution are rewriting the rules of production and services in digital code, genetic code, and atomic code. These technologies will create profound and disruptive effects. They are going to alter every industrial sector, and they're going to be the enabler for new business transformation, platforms for new industries, markets we can't even envision. They're going to unleash vast opportunities for innovation. One just example in the energy space, Craig Ventner, who's very famous as one of the founders and creators of the whole mapping of the human genome, now out in Silicon Valley, has a whole new focus on how he's creating IT-based software algorithms and bioorganisms to actually create limitless supplies of bioenergy. That's an example where all these, fu these disciplines are fusing together. They're, this is going to be the way also to solve the problems of humankind so that the, for the first time, hopefully, maybe not in our lifetime, but in the lifetimes of our children, 
every human being on this planet will have food. Every human being will have clean water. Every human being will have the ability to live in a home and be safe, secure, and have the basic needs to being a human being. Now, the nature of innovation itself has changed. And we see, of course, that as part of this transformation, the old innovation approach was that science and technology was really embedded in hardware, products, and processes. But now we have the new scope of innovation with web-based businesses and hardware that's tied to the services. Whether on the US side we look at the iPod, the iPhone, the iTunes, these were technology companies that actually changed and put at great threat but now have transformed the communication and entertainment industry for the distribution of music, broadcasting, and movies, where you have an IT company like Google that's now revolutionizing marketing. And of course, as I've already mentioned, the social networking, the co-creation that occurs through, site, through entities such as YouTube. Again, I, I, I don't want to just pick out one Korean company, but I'm very knowledgeable of what Samsung is doing in the frontiers of visualization. And visualization technology is very much part of this new innovation world. I like to use always Starbucks as an example of 21st century innovation because what they did really was t take a commodity product, coffee. None of their value comes from the coffee, actually. It's everything they created around it. The mystique, the service, the experience of going into these Starbucks companies. I, I like to joke because I have two teenage sons, and I see this at the council where our young people you know, never hesitate to go out three times a day and spend between five and six dollars a time on these crazy coffee concoctions. And somehow, Starbucks has managed to get the price for this, whether you're in Beijing, Boston, or Buenos Aires, young people are willing to pay for this Starbucks experience. That's a great example of 21st century innovation. Now, of course, another part of the changing nature of innovation is that it is multidisciplinary. And so much of the value is occurring at the intersections of disciplines and how these different spheres of activity are coming together. Examples, for instance, where biomaterials meld design, fabrication, and the life sciences together. Digital animation fuses the skills of computer graphics specialists with skills of storytellers and actors. You know, I, I, I think you all know, of course, that Japan is such a leader in digital animation with Nintendo and many other of their companies. And one of the things I've learned in, in over the years with my friends and colleagues in Japan, I've asked Japanese um, government officials as well as industrials, how do you create these, these animators? Because these are wild people, actually. And one of the things I've learned is that most of the great animators in Japan are outside of their system. They don't go through the Japanese educational system at all. But somehow they've managed to capture that creativity and put it in a way that it can be deployed as world-class commercial products. Now, biomimicry is another great driver for innovation, where biology and nature are displacing the machine as the model for design. And we're seeing again in this energy transformation where more efficient batteries may be enabled by viruses, swimsuits are replicating shark skins, strong lightweight steel sheets are inspired by bird bones. And one example that I love, um, we have a very close strategic partnership at the US Council with the Brazilian competitiveness movement. And I've just learned that a team of researchers at Purdue University and University of Sao Paulo have discovered a new insect in the Amazon, apparently the uh, species that we don't even know about yet in the Amazon are still staggering us with um, their potential. But there's an insect in the Amazon that apparently is absolutely beautiful. Its wings bring together the colors of sapphires, emeralds, rubies, and it's translucent. And what are they studying from this insect? The frontiers of optical computing. Who would have thought that even 10 years ago that was possible. Now, who are the innovators? Who are the innovators? Well, the expanded scope of innovation, its multidisciplinary character, 
has enlarged and expanded the skill base needed to develop and deploy and create value from innovative products and services. There's no one organization or discipline that has all the necessary resources for high value innovation. So the skill set must span arts and humanities, social sciences, business, design, marketing, management, as well, of course, as scientists and engineering. The professionals that we all know have to come out of their stovepipes. These different disciplines have to converge on problems and solutions. They have to learn from each other. They have to apply models from one field to the other. So we like to say now that we need engineers that think like artists and artists that think like engineers. We need to bring the artist to scientific visualization, the material scientist to fashion, and the cultural anthropologist to market research. We need platforms, learning and working environments in which these different disciplines can come together in a cauldron of creativity to fuel an explosion of ideas and innovations. One of the great examples in the United States of a company that does this and has been unique in what they have produced is DreamWorks Animation. For any of you who have children and have seen that movie Shrek, and, and I know Shrek 2 is the one in particular, they have a trailer at the end of the DVD and it shows these crazy people all working together supercomputing experts, musicians, designers, anthropologists they're all put together in one room and they come up with things like the story of Shrek 2 that actually is totally dependent too on the use of supercomputers where they are now able using supercomputers to show the emotion and the feeling of human beings through those tools. So the second transformation is the emergence of the conceptual economy. An economy in which ideas, learning, and delivering new kinds of value to the marketplace will be the premium for value, for wealth, and for standard of living. Ideas, rather than materials or physical brawn, have been by far the greatest contributors to the increases in real gross domestic product in the United States and certainly now in the developed economies going forward. Intangible assets are a growing share of corporate value. Thirty years ago, about 80 percent of the market value of the S&P 500 was represented by tangible assets, brick, mortar, equipment, and inventory. Today, we estimate that 80% of the value is represented by intangible assets, patents, intellectual property, trademarks, brands, research, software, and the cultural attributes of people, how they can work together. That's a huge intangible asset. And I just learned at the breakfast table that there's a new initiative in Korea on brands, which I think is very, very important. I've already mentioned how when you hurt your brand, and we've hurt our brand in the United States in financial services. We have hurt our brand tremendously in how our global financial services companies have behaved. And that is taking a huge toll on us. But every company in the world, if they don't protect their brand overnight, it can have catastrophic effects. Intangible assets now underpin the value of every high-tech company and industry and many consumer product companies. Look what happened over the last year to China's brands in terms of quality. Everybody now is very scared of buying Chinese toys. Why? Everybody, I mean, we found out in the United States that Mars Chocolate Company actually had Chinese uh, powdered milk in their products. It had a huge negative impact. Mars had to do a whole marketing campaign. So intangible assets and what happens to the integrity, the supply chain, and your brand you just can't put enough attention on that. So success for countries, companies, and workers will depend on their ability to work with intangible knowledge and idea-based assets and have the technology and management systems that know how to create value from them. So now let's look at something about the conceptual economy. And that is, and I mentioned this already, that jobs that involve routine manual and routine cognitive tasks have declined. And you see this only goes, this chart only to 2002, but you see how routine cognitive, routine manual are going below the zero line 
whereas expert thinking, complex communication, and how you fuse that are the, the, the skills of the future. So we see that lower skilled routine manufacturing jobs have been lost to both imports from developing countries and to automation. Many service industries use automation to do what people used to do. And of course now, with higher order skills rising in value, the jobs we need to all be working on and training our young people for are the jobs that require complex communications, interacting with people to get information, explaining it, persuading others of its implication, jobs that depend on expert thinking, solving problems for which there is no rule-based solution, complex work that varies case by case. And so far, machines are not very good at doing these tasks. But of course, that is again a big frontier of research, how to bring intelligence and logic into the world of machines. So how do we prepare our people for these jobs that require conceptual skills? Well, I think this is a very important concept and, and some issues on the conceptual economy. We are now transitioning from an age in which physical resources were the main factors of production to an age in which ideas, imagination, and creativity are the most important factors of production. We've moved away from the brute force economy to the brain force economy. This is why in the United States, and you saw this in our election campaign last year, there is tremendous tension in our society, in our politics, because we are now moving away from a world of the past to a world of the future. We see this with the decline of road standardized manufacturing. We see this with job loss, with income disparity, with immigration and offshoring. So what do we do going forward? Well, one, we can't replicate or keep the advantages of emerging economies. And we really don't want to. We can't create more scientists and engineers than China or India. You can't in Korea. We can't in the United States. We can't compete on these low-wage commodity products, standardized services, and routine technology development. Excellence in science alone is not going to ensure success. Because not only are nations building up their assets, because information and technology are increasingly commodities. The rewards do not go to those who just have a great deal of that. But it's those who know what to do with the knowledge, information, and technology once they get it and create these transformational values. I like to look back at the time of the Soviet Union. I did a lot of work with the former Soviet Union when I was in the White House Science Office. They had more scientists and engineers and very good ones and advanced ones than any country in the world. Did they create a competitive economy out of it? No. So this is why the innovation imperative is absolutely critical for our futures. We need to have high performance innovation ecosystems and it's from those platforms that we then build and deploy our comparative differentiated value. Talent is absolutely at the top of this. Yes, in addition to science and engineers, I've talked about the range of people we need to turn this knowledge and technology in, into innovation. And we need these skills across our workforce broadly. We need to foster that cauldron of creativity to produce an explosion of ideas that don't just sit on the shelf, but get turned in to products and services and value. In investment, we still have to invest in the leading edge R&D, and we have to ensure that our businesses and entrepreneurs have the capital they need to convert new knowledge, ideas, and technology into the business services and jobs. This, of course, is a big crisis right now. I was just reading on the plane about the crisis in the venture capital world at Silicon Valley. We see it, of course, in the debt financial world. And we're going to have to get this financial capital issue solved in the next few years. And we need infrastructure. We need infrastructure that is such as broadband. Korea has done a fantastic job, actually, on your broadband and your digital infrastructure for all of your um, citizens. And we need, as part of infrastructure, policies and regulations that fuel rather than impede innovation. I know that's a big theme of your National Competitiveness Council. Innovation-friendly regulation as opposed to innovation hindering and stifling innovation. And then finally, the last transformation, and I'm going to talk a little bit about energy environment in particular, is that 
All of the global grand challenges facing our world require international cooperation and consensus to achieve them. These are the challenges from energy and the environment, climate change, food and water shortages, dealing with pandemics, and global security threats from nuclear proliferation and terrorism to systemic long-standing rivalries in parts of the world such as the Middle East. And I would add to that the global challenges of the world's capital system and the global challenges around trade and market access and liberalization. These issues transcend national borders and they are linked, every one of us, every country has to be working on these. One needs to look no further than the Wall Street crisis and how that replicated very quickly into the international arena and threatened the stability of the world financial system. Now the one area I want to talk about this morning in the time we have is the energy security and sustainability challenge. Because again, this is one that is at a unique, unique point in human history where we are really looking at the transformation from the fossil fuel world to the new renewable non-fusil world of the future. Every nation has to have reliable access to energy. It's a basic need for economic growth and improved standards of living. But the dynamics of energy supply and, and demand are changing and neither an affordable nor reliable supply of energy is a given for any country. So let me look just quickly on the demand for energy. It's up by 40% by 2030. Developing countries are driving an increase. And transportation, of course, th that sector is a major, major player. With the projected increase in global oil demand driven by car fleets from an estimated 650 million vehicles in 2005 to about 1.4 billion by 2030. On the supply side, we've already heard this morning about the tenuous nature of access to oil and natural gas and meeting the energy demand will be very, very expensive. Not to mention the fact that so many of the oil exporting nations are hostile to democracies and to free democracies in the world. It's interesting, you know, Brazil found last year Petrobras, one of the greatest deep salt uh, oil supplies in the world. And they have a great debate now going on in Brazil whether they're going to exploit that just internally or they're going to open it up to international investment. In the case of Chevron, a very interesting um, little sideline here, when they discovered in the Gulf of Mexico a huge deep oil find, the only reason they were able to find that and take the risk to drill was because they had modeled and simulated that using supercomputers. Now we have the environmental challenge. And I think we're all very much aware this is a huge issue that's risen to the top of the political agenda. It's very much part of the new Obama administration's agenda where we've seen this 45% increase in CO2 emissions by 2030. And 90% of this is going to come from non-OECD countries. And so we see this potential of doubling of emissions by the end of the century. So when we look at the upcoming uh, post-Kyoto climate talks in Copenhagen, what is going to be the role of China and India? They have to be part of the solution. I have a little bit of data here on some of the carbon emissions and what they mean. And also, of course, that we have a double dilemma now on our hands. We must match energy supply and demand. At the same time, we have to cut greenhouse gas emissions. This is a very, very big challenge. One model has explored a potential global energy system that could stabilize the concentration of CO2 by the end of the century, but it offers a sobering perspective on the scale of the challenge. That model requires deploying thousands of 1,000 megawatt nuclear power plants and millions of wind turbines worldwide. The largest single crop covering the surface of the planet would be bioenergy plantations, not for food. So let's look also from the competitiveness viewpoint of energy and environmental challenge. There is no question that this is a huge trade and competitiveness issue. In 2007, 
Energy-related imports accounted for 36% of the U.S. trade deficit, up from one-fifth in less than two years ago. We heard already about the impact of this for Korea being so dependent completely on imports. By April 2007, it was 47% of the U.S. trade deficit. Now, of course, we saw from July to November this collapse in the price of oil. But that notwithstanding, this is a tremendous transfer of wealth outside of the United States to many countries that are hostile to us. And the higher energy costs have impacted a wide range of business operations. Indeed, it's a huge part of the increasing cost of moving goods, it's challenging the calculus of production slicing, global supply chains, leading to the rearrangement of production among industries and countries. One good thing is we're seeing that a lot of manufacturing is coming back to the United States because of energy. Procter & Gamble, for the first time, is putting one of its most advanced manufacturing plants in the United States, building that infrastructure because of energy. And, of course, energy scarcity, we know, is a new driver in geopolitics. So we have this current trajectory of global energy trends that is unsustainable. It's unsustainable environmentally, economically, and socially. And so these are now first-tier economic, national security, and competitiveness concerns. And that is why, actually, this is a perfect storm for innovation and why energy innovation is really one of the great paths to the future, to competitiveness, and stimulating the global economy. Because we need to invest $45 trillion in alternative energy technologies by 2050. This is a lot of money, but the level investment could not only drive this energy revolution, but it could lead to a transformation in the way we live, produce energy, if we do it right. And so we can look at this as an opportunity to move to this new era of technological advances on innovation on every scale. We will create new industries that are for manufacturing, power system, appliance, homes, and cars. And we know, and this is exciting, that the clean energy world is projected to be a $100 trillion million market by 2030. The private sector in the U.S. and Korea, all over the world, is making huge investments. In 2007, global investments in clean energy totaled $148 billion, 60% higher than in 2006, and it continues and it continues to grow. In the United States, the U.S. government plans to invest more than $3 billion in 2009 in fundamental science and technology, and our energy investments have increased 80% since 2006. But I will say that as we already are seeing emerging innovations, we're seeing an expanded portfolio of energy resources. We know there's no single bullet. So the portfolio has to be, yes, in fossil fuels, but in solar, in hydrogen, in biomass, wind, geothermal, and nuclear. And we're also seeing how this is replicating through our economies, creating new industries such as bioplastics and agroenergy biotechnology. Uh, the chairman of the council, DuPont, is already doing biofabrication now, moving away from petrochemicals as the core feedstock for their manufacturing. We have to do this right. These are the obvious reasons why. And we have to do this in a way if we're going to promote economic development and poverty reduction in the emerging economies. And one point I want to mention, because it's so critical for getting the U.S.-Korea free trade agreement ratified by both countries is, if we allow protectionism and shutting the doors and not allowing the access and deployment of these new clean energy technologies, not only will we cause tremendous pro uh, problems for the global economy and recovery, but we will significantly retard the movement to the true 21st century economy of the world. And I just learned recently that the United States and Denmark have signed a very unique agreement that enables each of our two countries to have access to their other markets as if they were Danish companies, have the same treatment as U.S. companies, and vice versa. This is a very important model for those countries that are going to be the innovators in this arena. Now, the Council on Competitiveness, and I, I want to quickly move forward this, but this is very important. 
We launched a major initiative almost two years ago, Energy Security Innovation and Sustainability. It's chaired by the CEO of Caterpillar, Jim Owens, the president of Rensselaer, Dr. Shirley Ann Jackson, and the head of the utility workers. We are making the business case between energy security and competitiveness. And what are the drivers of private inve investment? What is the business case for changing energy usage? How can companies integrate energy and carbon management into their business strategy for competitive advantage? And then what is the policy and regulatory framework to support energy investment and innovation? We are focused on, really, the link between energy security and U.S. competitiveness, and we're aiming for the sweet spot. And I think this chart really captures very nicely the sweet spot between competitiveness, sustainability, and energy security. So what did we do over the last year? Well, we created a 100-day action plan. I have it here. It's on our website that we released on September of this year for the new administration. We didn't know who would win the election, but we're asking policymakers now to have a very aggressive agenda going forward. And it's including setting the global bar for energy efficiency, ensuring access to clean, effective energy, jump-starting infrastructure, spawning entrepreneurship, mobilizing a world-class energy workforce, and clearing obstacles to a national transmission super highway. And let me just mention, I'll, I'll go back actually for a minute here. We now recognize that the U.S. government has purchasing power. So one of the first things we're asking the new president to do is require that all government purchases actually lead towards energy efficiency, good services and facilities, green power and advanced vehicles. We're asking that current tax policies that inhibit the turnover of old, less efficient capital stock actually be changed. And we're recognizing that we have to have a new vehicle for accessing debt capital. So we've proposed the creation of a clean energy bank that would be capitalized at $200 billion. Now, I was very excited on Sunday to see in the Washington Post that the transition team for President-elect uh, Obama has actually now adopted our clean energy uh, bank proposal, not at a $200 billion level investment, much more modest than that, but that's a major, major first start. And finally, I will mention that in terms of the transmission grid, the United States has a miserable patchwork of state regulations, state authorities that enable, do not enable us to have a 21st century um, grid for the transmission of all electricity. We want to have a seamless electric power, power grid highway that is intelligent, that is self-healing, that is modeled and simulated using supercomputers to get our energy on and off the roads, just as we did when we created our energy uh, high, or our highway system in the 50s and 60s. Now, quickly turning to the future of competitiveness, on November of this year, we issued our new competitiveness agenda for the president coming in, and it has some very exciting um, components to it. Under talent, a compete pass. And actually, um, this is a very exciting new initiative where our companies will actually say what skills do they need and put resources in for training in partnership with the government. And then any American worker who signs up for this will be guaranteed a job. We also, of course, want to ensure that our math, science, and R&D and our schools are all aligned for these 21st century challenges. Under investment. We, again, want to double our investment in R&D, but you will look here on this chart. We want to keep our corporate tax rate at 25%. We have the second highest in the world after Japan. This is not good for our competitiveness. And we also want to make our R&D tax credit permanent as well. On infrastructure, a very creative idea of the Council on Competitiveness has been to create now the America Compete Savings Bond. When I was a child and when I was in the government, we always deducted so much of our salary for triple E savings bonds. People don't do that anymore. 
And our proposal is to have tax-free compete bonds that every American invest in and the proceeds will be used to invest in this infrastructure that we need for the future. And I will also say on the infrastructure that reasserting leadership in global trade and development, multilateral trade negotiations, pursuing and getting ratified our bilateral trade talks is also at the height of our list. And finally, just last week, Chad Holliday and I went in to see the leaders in our Senate and Congress about our new initiative called Rebound, which is a short-term proposal for the stimulus of our economy. Our CEOs have said they are sitting on a lot of capital and cash. What do we do to unlock that and get the economy going? One is to actually change our depreciation schedules so instead of uh, depreciating capital stock over a period of three, five, three to five years to enable companies to do that immediately, to enable the average American consumer to get huge tax breaks if they buy energy efficient products, products and then to invest in the next generation of infrastructure. So let me conclude by saying that as we go forward on this energy, security, and sustainability initiative, we want to include our global partners. We're going to be having, in uh, September next year, a national summit on this topic, a national day, and then a global international day. I would like to formally invite Korean CEOs as well as Korean government leaders to participate with us. We are very excited to take some competitiveness recommendations to Copenhagen. It's very important that business interests be represented in Copenhagen and we're just very delighted that both the governments of Denmark and Sweden have turned to the US Council to be partners on this. So I will be working with my Korean partners here to ensure that you are with us as we go forward on that. I also would like to say that as the oldest competitiveness council in the world the U.S. Council is in the process of putting together a network of global competitiveness councils. Um, we are going to convene a meeting of that in the United States next year. Korea, again, with your new competitiveness council, is very much part of the inner circle of this. We want to work very closely with you as we shape this, as we do with our partners in Brazil, in Mexico, in the EU, as well as in China and India. And let me, my final remark I want to make today is that we have to look at competitiveness and innovation in a world of prosperity and growth, not of scarcity and shrinking back. I'm an archaeologist, and so I always look at the continuum of human civilization and progress. I specialize in the Bronze Age of the Mycenaean Minoan world, in, in the Greek world, and I look at what these great civilizations had that made them great, that made them game changers. They were all innovators. They created science and technology. They were also living on the cutting edge of art and architecture, philosophy, science. They were fusers of knowledge. They were cauldrons of creativity. They were crossroads of culture. They attracted the best and brightest to come and live. Your great civilization of the Silas culture was also a model of that. So let's all team together to look at the world as one of growth, of prosperity and opportunity, and come together to make this next generation the best ever in humankind. Thank you very much for having me with you today. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Wen Simis really has brought us into a, a completely new world. Uh, digital economy. She touched upon the basic nature of digital revolution, new technology landscape, and uh, also changing nature of innovation. And finally, conceptual economy. Uh, as an economist, uh, uh, this is first time you know, for me to hear this word. And uh, also, she carried on very in-depth analysis on supply and demand situation of the global energy the outlook. Furthermore, she also brought in the 100-day energy action plan. I think that is also very important for Korea to listen. And uh, finally, I think the, she really touched upon many important points uh, in the newly emerging uh, 
digital economy. Uh, before the you know, opening up the floor, you know, she just flew uh, from Washington D.C. and uh, here landed so uh, last night. Uh, I was told that it was six o'clock. Let me ask this question: uh, How can you get such dynamic, innovative energy? You know, just for yourself. I don't see any symptom of you know jet lag. Please tell us. I, I, I'm very much interested in that. <laughs> well, actually, I had a lovely flight on Korean Air, and I enjoyed it very much. And I had a little nap, and I read, and I was just saying at the breakfast table, you know, we all complain about these airline trips, but you are alone for a few minutes, and you can think and recharge. So, but I do have a lot of energy. Um, but I'm getting a little older, too, so I have to slow down. I have to be in Saudi Arabia right after the inauguration, so my first visit there. But um, I think all of us that are excited about things have energy and we bring it to, to our work and our passion and I have a lot of passion for what we're all working on together. My name, my name is uh, working for a Korean language newspaper. Uh, thank you for your uh, uh, insightful uh, presentation. Uh, I, 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 I had an impression that uh, you, your, uh, your uh, presentation seems uh, like a uh, broad general uh, advice to the uh, to the globe. Uh, by the way, my question is, what uh, were your advice to the outgoing Bush administration, and what will be your uh, advice to the incoming Obama administration? And in addition to that, if you have some more time, what will be your advice to the Korean uh, government? Actually, we're very fortunate on competitiveness issues that there is a very broad bipartisan support for a lot of what I was talking about. When um, the Council on Competitiveness did our National Innovation Summit back in 2004, which was chaired by the CEO of IBM, Sam Palmasano, and the president of Georgia Tech, and a great group of leaders, uh, our ad agenda called Innovate America actually became the baseline for the National Academy of Sciences to do some recommendations. And what was very exciting was that the Bush administration embraced that, as did the Democratic and Republican members of Congress. And the legislation was passed, the American Compete Act. It's not yet fully funded. But there's a lot of, of consensus on these issues. The areas where there's difference is really on tax policy. That's a big issue. And you know, we remember in the campaign, uh, uh, then, camp, then Senator Obama was very much against um, you know, any breaks for corporate America. You know, we, we were, everybody's projecting a lot of tax increases. Now with the global crisis, we're seeing, you know, projected tax um, in, uh, cuts. But I think that's a big difference is on the tax regulatory uh, uh, situation. And then the other area, actually, and I feel very positive about this because I think that one negative uh, development during our campaign was the very bad talk about trade. And I will say this again as a historian, as an archaeologist, there is no great civilization ever in human history that has looked inward and shut its doors. They have all been traitors. They have all reached out. And for the United States to not see its role as leading and shaping in the global economy through increasing trade, I think is very short-sighted and quite frankly goes against the actual facts of how global prosperity is in everyone's interest. I mean, I use this example. Why in the United States should we be concerned about roses coming into our country from Colombia? They're great. I mean, why, why are we worried? That does not detract from our prosperity. But building up global prosperity is very important through trade. And I think that the new administration now, with the appointments that they have made, which are very good so far, as, as, as I see them, will come much back to the middle on that. And you know there may be some adjustment, but I think we will see um, the revitalization of that and our leadership. And I, I'm very hopeful for that as well. But I think the other area that will be a big departure is on linking the energy transformation with environment and climate change. And actually the appointment for the new Secretary of Energy, Dr. Stephen Chu, a Nobel Prize winner, has been on the steering committee for the Council's Energy Project. We're very proud he mentioned that in his official biography. John Holdren, the new science advisor, has been very active with us. 
Governor Napolitano, who's the head of um, new secretary designate for Homeland Security. She created her whole initiative as the head of the National Governors Association around regional innovation and coming to the U.S. Council to help design that. So I think we're going to see a lot of great continuity on competitiveness, but there will be change on energy and environmental issues and moving out very aggressively on that. Uh, th thank you, Dr. Winsmith. Uh, you have given us a whole lot uh, in years of the work of the Council uh, through your, uh, this morning's presentation, and especially your coverage in the latter part of your lecture on the energy security and innovations and so on, I think strike the same chord as this government's so-called green growth strategy. Yes. And I think uh, uh, there was a lot which was very informative for, for us from the perspective. I have two questions. Uh, one small one is this. You have introduced a new uh, word uh, concept, conceptual economy. Is that conceptually different from what now passes as knowledge-based economy? Uh, yeah. Here is a more complex uh, uh, question. I think uh, President-elect Obama uh, revealed during his uh, election campaign misunderstandings, uh, some misunderstandings about the uh, impact, the, 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 the uh, intended effect of the Korea US FTA, as well as of the true nature of the problems that the US auto industry uh, uh, faces. Uh, the, the, uh, the, the actually, one intended impact of the U.S.-Korea FTA was to uh, help uh, alleviate some of the problems that the U.S. auto industry probably has been suffering from. And uh, my question is, what do you think should happen to the U.S. auto industry and what do you think will happen to the U.S. auto industry? That's really, I came up with that uh, concept. I don't know that it will have any traction, but I, I, I think concept, you know, conceptual is a very powerful world, word. It takes you many places. But knowledge, you know, once we get knowledge, we have it, but we got to use it. And th what I'm trying to convey is the knowledge economy, the knowledge moves, it's, it moves so quickly all over the world. I mean, everybody has it almost, almost instantaneously given these, and, and that's not a bad thing, that's a good thing. We want to have a baseline of knowledge. I mean, we want people throughout the world to know, you know, how you clean your food and have clean water, I mean, all of those things. But it's what you do with them, and that's where you have to conceive of things and look at things in a different way and be very creative. Now, you can be very creative, but if you don't have the infrastructure and the platforms to do something with it, well, then they're just ideas. So you have to have both. So that's kind of the thinking behind the conceptual economy. Um, on the issue of the auto industry, that's a really long story, but a couple things. One, their relationship, and I'm not an expert on the auto industry, um, but their relationships with organized labor, um, you know, in a simple way, a lot of people say that during the flush years, you know, they would just throw them kind of red meat, whatever they wanted, and so they had incredibly rich you know, I didn't even talk about health care, by the way. I should mention that. That's a huge Achilles heel for the U.S. economy, is how to deal with innovation in health care, given the cost of that in terms of our individual national gross expenditures. But, you know, the health care packages, I mean, I hear about They're unbelievable. If you're a retired auto worker, you know, you go in for a little tiny sneeze. They have a tremendously rich pack. That's costing them a huge amount, and the data's all there, you know, how much that costs them versus the Japanese and other producer. So they've got that challenge. The other thing is, you know, they spent a lot of time fighting very effectively in Washington against getting any emission standards that they didn't like. They wrote a long time on, you know, the vision that the SUVs and all those big, you know, cars were really what people wanted. And when I was back in the uh, Commerce Department, the first Bush administration, I remember going to see one of the prototype electric cars and driving it, and they gave that up. And they didn't have the long-term, you know, vision of where, where, where the future was going to be. You look at a country like Brazil, who made all those changes early on, on, you know, their, their, their uh, ethanol base. And one of the great ironies is, I mean, do you know who makes all the flex fuel engines for, and their biggest market for, G, for General Motors? You know where all, most of their profits, big profits are coming from? 
Brazil. They make all the engines and everything that enabled that biofuel transportation system. Well, they didn't do it in the United States. So I don't know what the trajectory is going to be going forward, but you know, clearly we cannot politically see that industry just totally atrophy and go away. It's too important for our economy. So um, I think this bailout, whatever you want to call it, and how it's going to be structured had to be done. And um, you know, given the amount of money we've done on the financial side, this is a really small amount of money. So, but I certainly, I mean, I'm not an expert on how the Korean component of this fits in, but the extent to which it does to make the U.S. auto industry more competitive, I hope that collaboration, and I really hope the FTA agreement gets ratified be between both our countries. My name is Yeo Hong-ku. I'm uh, president of uh, World Economic Research Institute. I understand the United States has, uh, has made great efforts to promote innovation and use of renewable energies. Would you explain in more detail what sector uh, out of several sectors like biofuels, wind power, sunshine power, and etc. Uh, what sector your government focuses on, and uh, what aid uh, or support your government provide to the private sector to promote innovation in the renewable energy sector? Thank you. Thank you. No one believes there's one source or one single bullet that we need to utilize and exploit all of them in a way that is environmentally correct and reduces the carbon footprint. And so, give you an example. The United States is the Saudi Arabia of coal. We have so much good coal. So, does that mean we're not gonna use coal anymore? No. What it means is that we have got to develop and deploy the systems for carbon capture and sequestration and producing this in a way that does not you know, have the detrimental effect on the carbon footprint. And there's a lot of research underway to do that. So that's one example. On the nuclear, there is clearly a reassessment, not just in the United States, but in Europe and everywhere, on the issue of nuclear power. And quite frankly, in our national laboratories, we have the technologies now for how to deal with the waste and the storage and the actual conversion of this waste into energy because so much of the depleted uranium actually is just sitting in pools right now. That, has, that nuclear issue is very politically driven. It's not scientifically driven. And I think with the new science advisor and the new secretary of energy being experts, we're going to get through some of that on the nuclear side. Now, in terms of solar and wind, you know, one of the issues is, and we talked at the table about this, you have to have the storage capability to store this and get it on the grid. And so that's another innovation frontier. And so you have a seamless ability to use and deploy all this energy. So I think what we're going to see on the R&D side is a lot of focus on storage, on batteries, as well as on transmission. And as I mentioned, getting a national transmission system that's not cut up by each one of these states. And that's going to be sensitive politically because we have this state's right issue. But you know, when you look back, and when I was a child, we built highways that went across the states. You know, you didn't come to between Ohio and India and then have to have a whole new national highway. We got to do that for energy too. So I can't say there's any one single. Now on biofuels, uh, Corn-based biofuel is really not the path for the future. And so, again, cellulosic, um, all of those things are really the frontier of biofuels. And I think that we will see both the economics driving that as well as um, the impact of that on food supply. Technology Investment Corporation, thank you for your insightful uh, presentation this morning. Dr. Yun Smith. Uh, next to overall administration and uh, as well as uh, e-member government uh, <coughs> promoting green growth strategy. Uh, my question
question is specific. Uh, do you recommend your government to introduce carbon tax or cap and trade uh, scheme? Because uh, we are talking about green growth strategies, but we are not the uh, more silence silent in in this. Uh, general scheme. What is your recommendation to your government as well as Korean government? Not the formal position of the U.S. Council on Competitive. This is my personal view. And this is the, the, the view and analysis that most economists will say and believe that in terms of transparency, efficiency, not favoring any one sector of the economy and really having um, the predictability of putting a transparent price on carbon, it should be a tax. And the cap and trade systems, you know, if, we've done a lot of work. There are a lot of studies on how it's working in Europe. Um, there are lots of problems with it. Now, it's fashionable right now to do cap and trade, but I think if you still haven't made that decision here in, the United, in Korea, you really ought to think carefully about that. And because a lot of times in the cap and trade, you're just kind of moving things around, actually. Now, there are some exchanges and things that are making a lot of money from that. But um, again, we, what we're going to come out with in our big national, after our 100-day plan, we will not, I'm sure, make a recommendation for the tax of the carbon trade as much as the need for having a transparent price on carbon that is predictable and that companies can then plan and make their investments around. I don't know if that is, I think that's the best I could do on that one. And you know, one other thing I'll say, you know, on the European experience, I've asked some European ministers this, and without mentioning co countries, they have lost a lot of advanced significant manufacturing to China just over cap and trade. And in this crisis, when you look back at the jobs and everything, you know, that's a very serious thing, too, in the overall way of handling this. Korea has yes. not all science technology. Congratulations on your institution. It's very famous and important. Thank you very much. And first of all, let me congratulate your very insightful presentation on the competitiveness of the future. My question is about the evaluation of national competitiveness. Uh, annually, uh, some institutions like uh, World Economic Forum and IMD, the Swiss based business yes. board, published some rankings of national competitiveness. Uh, not only Korean journalists, but also Korean policymakers are very sensitive on uh, the changes of uh, rankings of Korean and other countries. Right? Uh, my question is that. Uh, does your council or do you take seriously some kind of uh, these rankings of uh, uh, the country's competitiveness, uh, not only in the United States but also other countries? Or uh, does your council analyze some status of the national competitiveness of other countries or including the United States? But one of the things we're going to be doing, and again, this is something that we'd very much like to have some Korean partners with us in a leadership role. We are just beginning to put together our process for our next index. It takes us usually two to three years to do this because it's, it's hard. But what we want to do, and this is the exciting part for economists and, and researchers, is we want to develop with our global partners, and the Irish have already agreed to be in this, the Brazilians, um, the Swedes, the Danes, and the Japanese, and, and, and Korea very much needs to be part of this for obvious reasons when you hear this. We want to develop a whole new set of metrics on how you understand and measure competitiveness instead of them just being the traditional you know, input metrics. How many scientists and engineers you have? How many patents? You know, really look at how we begin to understand and capture a lot of these intangible assets as well as the things that over time I mean I'll give you Singapore as an example Singapore you know always gets high ratings and things and there are lots of great things city Singapore is a city-state 
Singapore is a city state. And, you know, I, I hope there's no one here from Singapore because I have tremendous admiration for what they've done. But let me just throw this question out. I mean, I know who all the great Korean brands are. What are the Singapore brands? What are they? Apart from Singapore Airlines and having beautiful orchids. I mean, what are the brands? <laughs> And I heard a really brilliant person say, you know, Singapore is a very important piece in the global production slicing. But in terms of what we're all dealing with here, you know, is Singapore going to surpass the United States or Korea really in terms of overall competitiveness? And but I don't think so. I don't think Finland's going to surpass the United States, and yet Finland gets a higher ranking. So these rankings are very. Um, I don't want to say spurious because there are many good things in them, but we need to look at it in a different way. And, you know, the United States, we always get uh, a bad ranking on the role of women. Okay, we get a bad ranking because we don't give as much maternity leave as the Europeans do. Well, I'm going to brag here. You know, I, I shouldn't say this, but, you know, I'm in my mid-50s. Okay, you guys know. <laughs> In my generation, there's no country in the world that has women that are at the highest level of every, every sector. Government, industry, we got more university presidents, all of this. And we get a low ranking for the role of women in the United States because we don't give as much maternity leave. Well, you know, that's ridiculous, I think. So again, I don't, you know. <laughs> But anyway, I hope you'll join us in coming up with, you know, some new ways of looking. And, and culture is so important. Culture is so important. How do we capture some of those things about culture? Short question. I, I have several questions. But I don't I'm being too long. I apologize. Uh, uh, to what extent, uh, my name is Yi sang so Li is my favorite name. To what extent President Obama-elect after he's uh, inaugurated, could serve to build the world without violence, terror, and war in the coming years, in your view? That's a great question. Well, he obviously, um, you know, once he became president-elect, you know, that process that that occurs, I mean, he was having some of these security briefings before as a, as a candidate. But once he became the president-elect, you know, a whole different world occurred in terms of what access to information he was getting about what's going on in the world. I think just the, the fact of his election and what it means for our country, you know, to really have a African-American uh, become president of this country with his youth and his energy is, is very symbolic, not just for our country, for the world. So that in itself is very, very significant. <coughs> I do not think that there will be a drastic change in national, I mean, these are my personal views of national security policy as some might want. Um, I also think his appointments, um, choosing as national security advisor, General Jim Jones, who's one of our great military leaders, had been the head of NATO, a fantastic person, both political parties is very significant choosing Admiral Blair of the same stature, and of course, keeping Secretary Gates. So that doesn't mean that it's not going to be a continuation of whatever in the Bush administration, but there's going to be continuity. And, um, you know, at the end of the day, and I'm sure you know this in Korea, the ultimate responsibility of a president is to keep a nation safe. And so I, I think that will be very much... Um, at, at, it must be at the top of, of his agenda. But I certainly think, you know, reaching out and negotiating and communicating in a different way with his personality and will be part of that. So there will be change, but there will be continuity. Okay, number one, you know, you really addressed uh, a rather medium and long-term issues, okay? But at this point, uh, Korea as well as the United States uh, under tremendous pressure how to resolve serious unemployment problems, right. okay? Uh, at this point, Korean government is basically, what, well, they're suffering the, the worst unemployment record uh, perhaps ever in recent history. 
government is concerned about to create job opportunities, basically Same for the us. social safety, you know, net related works. Uh, and my question is, how we can you compromise your uh, medium and long term goals and immediate pressure for creating? you know, the job opportunities in U.S. as well as Korea. And second question, uh, the, the President-elect Obama, he promised to sign up Kyoto Protocol during his election campaign. Uh, when do you think he will do that? Okay, two questions. Thank you. Well, on the first, on the, the stimulus, the rebound, you know, getting the economy going and the job creation, you know, we're all dealing with that. And you know, the, the, the numbers that are now floating around for the U.S. proposed stimulus package are huge, in addition to the financial bailout or whatever you want to call that. Um, my view is that, yes, we have to go into debt. I mean, we're going to increase our deficit, and at some point, you know, you have to pay for that. But to, to get these jobs and the economy going, what would, is, this is a unique time we have to spend money for things that we would like to have done but maybe couldn't have in another environment. So let's spend the money to create the new world. And that's why this green jobs, this whole infrastructure is so, so important and an opportunity. I mean, that's how we got out of our depression in the 30s, the public works. And the extent to which we provide, I mean, I'll, I'll give you one concrete example. One of our active members in the council, who's fantastic CEO, is Fred Smith, the founder of FedEx. And, you know, FedEx is sitting on a lot of money. And at our recent meeting, he said, how do we unleash the industrial capacity of our country to hire people to do things to invest? And a lot of it relates, of course, to some of these tax provisions. You know, they're going to wait out if they don't have the surety. So getting the tax encouragement going for companies to hire, I mean, get maybe all sorts of benefits for hiring, and then target that money in a coordinated way for the infrastructure you need for your company. I mean, you are way ahead of us on broadband. I mean, Korea is a, is a model on what you've done on broadband. We want to spend some of our stimulus to finally get, you know, broadband out to every part of our country. That's going to create a lot of jobs. So you need to link the stimulus, the infrastructure in a way that's going to not just be, I mean, the worst thing we did last year was when we gave everybody, these are my personal view, we gave everybody the, those little, whatever they, rebate checks for five or six, you know, people said, oh, well, they just went and bought Chinese stuff at Walmart. Well, that's not a stimulus. <laughs> it put money in the economy, but it didn't use it in a way. Now, I have to also say, you ask about energy. Oh, yeah. Um, I think that whether, I don't know what he's going to do on Kyoto, but I do know that the path to Copenhagen is going to be very much where their attention and leadership is. And maybe part of that is to, is to ratify Kyoto on the way. But I have to just also say on the role of the consumer, there has to be a better balance in the world. The American consumer was leading the global recovery in the 2001 period. And we have to increase our savings, and the rest of the world has to consume more and say we have to have more balance in that. And unfortunately, I promised my husband that I wouldn't buy anything when I came on this trip. <laughs> but I had to. He called. He said it's okay. Well, <laughs> with my, my energy last night, I did have to. Since I don't have them, I did have to contribute to the economy with a few Korean amethysts. So I did my job here. <laughs> Please join me in thanking her again for very valuable contribution.